The story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A dozen churches in your city are victimized by a team of experienced safe burglars. You track the suspects for weeks. You finally apprehend three men. Your job? Convict them. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, March 5th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 11.30 p.m. when I got to room 25A, the interrogation room. Excuse me, Ben? Yeah, Joe? Got a minute? Yeah, sure. Wait here, Brighton. Back in a minute. All right. Yeah? Let's go out in the hall. Listen, huh? How you doing with Bryson? Did he tell you anything? No, he won't admit a thing. How about the other two men? No, nothing. They're sitting tight, waiting for their lawyer to show up. Had all three of them checked through R&I. Bryson's a two-time loser, burglary GTA. His two partners served time for robbery. We shouldn't have too much trouble putting them away. We got a good enough collection of physical evidence. Well, maybe. Heard from the crime lab yet? No, not yet. I'd feel a lot better about it if we'd get Bryson to cop out. Let's call him again, huh? Yeah, might as well. Nothing to lose. Go ahead. Keep your seat, Bryson. Got a few more questions for you. Excuse me. I thought you had it all squared away by now, Thought you were going to sack and leave by now. Well, afraid not, Bryson. You haven't even given us a story yet. Well, I told you I didn't have anything to do with it. It seems pretty obvious I didn't. I thought you'd take my word for it. Can you think of any reason why we should? You lied to us once already, didn't you? I didn't lie to you. I told you the truth. I, I didn't break into that church. I didn't have anything to do with it. On the way in here, we asked you if you'd ever been arrested before, and you told us no. Our record bureau says you're a two-time loser. Oh, well, well I'm, I'm sorry about that, Sergeant. I really am. When you picked me up, I guess I got a little nervous. I, I, I didn't mean to lie to you. I was just a little mixed up, I guess. You've got a little time to settle down. You ought to be able to tell us your story now. Just relax and take your time, huh? Martin? Right. Well, what did the other two fellows tell you, Miller and Henderson? Well, what difference did that make to you? Well, it might make a lot of difference, sir. Well, you just tell us your story. That's all we ask. What were you doing at the scene of the burglary? What business did you have there? If you weren't mixed up in it, you got nothing to hide. I haven't got anything to hide. I just don't want to involve a lot of innocent people, that's all. Anything you tell us is going to help you, you know that. No, uh, but... Uh, all right, sir. It's strictly confidential, huh? Well, one of those other fellows you picked up tonight, the dark-haired fellow, his name's Miller, Tony Miller. He's engaged to marry my sister. Yeah, well, I said you had to do that. Now, please, give me a chance. All right. I'd like to lay it all out for you. Go ahead. Well, ever since my sister got engaged to Miller, I've been worried about it. I never liked him to begin with. Lately, I've been keeping an eye on Miller, him and that friend of his, Henderson. Yeah. I knew they were up to something, and then I read in the paper about that string of church burglaries, the guys breaking into churches, nothing at the safe. Yeah. Well, I had an idea as Miller and his friend. Well, how do you mean, Bryce? What made you think it was in? I had an idea, that's all. I, I couldn't prove anything. It was just a hunch. You must have had some reason to suspect them. Well, nothing definite? No, I, I, I just knew something was wrong that they were up to something. Well, then, early tonight, I saw a friend of Tony Miller. They were on the bars in the neighborhood. I talked to him a while, and he finally told me that Miller and Henderson were out working a deal. Said they were going to break into a church over on 8th Street and knock over the city. Well, how come this friend of Miller let you in on it? Well, I guess he thought I was a pretty close friend of Tony's. He knew Tony was going to marry my sister. Anyway, when I found out about it, I got over to that church as fast as I could. I, I wanted to find Miller and Henderson and try and talk him out of it. I didn't want any guy who was going to marry my sister getting into trouble like that. But, you know, maybe going to jail for burglary. Well, Miller's been in jail before. I suppose you knew that. Yeah, I knew it, but that was before he was engaged to my sister. You met Miller and Henderson outside the church, did you? No, I, I was too late. They'd already broken into the place. So I, I went around the back of the church, and I saw one of the stained glass windows was broken where they'd gotten in. I climbed up on the sill, and I could see him working inside it. Some kind of a small back room. They were working on the safe, both of them, Miller and Henderson. Oh, that's so. What'd you do then? Why, well, I, I tried to talk them out of it. They, they wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. I suppose you can prove your story. I mean, that friend you met in the bar, the one who tipped you off about the burger, I guess he'd be willing to back up his story. Well, I'm not sure, Sergeant. He might lie. He might not want to get involved. How about Miller and Henderson? They'll back it up. Well, if, if you weren't involved in the deal, there wouldn't be any reason for them to implicate you, would Well, Tony Miller thinks it's my fault he's in jail. He hates me. You can't take his word for anything. Probably the first thing he'd do is lie about it, and Henderson, too. Well, who you got to corroborate your story? 
Well, maybe nobody, but it's the truth. I swear to you, it's the truth. I'll tell the same thing in court if I have to. they got to believe. You're asking a lot, Matthew. But that's the way it happened, so help me. Yeah. Now, tell me the truth, Sergeant. You know I didn't have a hand in it. If it goes to court, they couldn't convict me, could they? Come on, what do you think? I think you're a liar. <laughs> to the working detective, the one logical way to appraise a known criminal is by his record. You estimate him the same way you check a particular make of automobile, a racehorse, or a radio set by past performance. By refusing to buy his trumped-up story, we didn't figure that we were doing the suspect Charles Bryson an injustice. Bryson was 37 years old. He'd spent 13 of those 37 years in prison, either the county jail or the state penitentiary. His criminal record dated back to the time he was 20 years old. Besides serving numerous shorter terms for lesser offenses in the county jail, Bryson had spent two terms in the state penitentiary for burglary. Despite the efforts of the probation officers, the adult authority, and the rehabilitation officials to help him, he seemed content to go along in his criminal career. In this particular case, the series of church burglaries. We had good reason to believe that Bryson and his two accomplices, Miller and Henderson, were the guilty men. All three of them were booked at the main jail on suspicion of 459 PC. The next morning, Ben and I checked in at the crime lab. Lee Jones, you around? Yeah, I'm here. Come on back. Well, how about that? They gave the place a new coat of paint. Yeah, sure needed it. Good morning, fellas. How you doing, Lee? That set of burglary tools those thieves were using in that church last night just finished checking them over. Might have two or three things for you. What do you got, Lee? Have a look over here. Uh-huh. You find set of tools, I take it the thieves had a lot of practice. All three of them had records. How about some of the other physical evidence you got there? One thing at a time, Joe. First of all, these tools here. Uh-huh. Small sledge, these three jimmy, pinch bar, and the screwdriver. I think we can tie them in with at least six of those church burglaries. I think we can do it for certain. Good enough for three convictions? I think so. The jury's listening. Well, how you got it worked out, Lee? Tool markings? Now, that's part of it, yeah. Why don't you take a look at this pinch bar here? They did a lot of that work with this. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't have to tell you there aren't two identical pinch bars in the world that could leave the same exact markings on a piece of woodwork or on a safe. Yeah. There aren't a pair of tools in the world that can leave the same markings on anything. Yeah, we know, but can you show a jury positively that the thieves used this pinch bar here on six of the jobs they pulled? That's the idea. I compared specimen markings of every one of these tools against the markings made at the point of entry on six of the churches these thieves broke into. In every case, the markings match perfectly. These are the tools that made them, no doubt about it. The screwdriver, the set of windows, and the pinch bar. Yeah, it sure won't hurt our case, Amy. Get anything else, Lee? I examined the end of the pinch bar under the microscope, check the screwdriver and Jimmy's tool. The tips of each one of them are contaminated with particles of paint, different kinds of paint. Mm -hmm. I've already compared these paint transfers with samples of paint taken from the exterior of those churches that were broken into. Each one of them, they match all the way. The color of the paint, the age, degree of oxidation, the lead content, compares perfect. Now come over here, something else. Mm -hmm. What you got there, Amy? These are the shoes the two men you found inside the church were wearing. These are the foot impressions the boys from Lake and Prince lifted off the floor in front of the safe inside the church. Yeah, so. Yeah, linoleum on that church floor showed up the dust impressions of the feet pretty good. Did you make the burn? Yeah, the boys from Lake and Prince did, yeah. Good impressions. See here? General size of the shoe, the make, heel impressions, the wear travel on the sole here, the whole general characteristics of both pair of shoes. Matches up to a team. Mm, how much is that going to mean to a jury, man? Well, it'll mean a lot. It's the truth. The same thing I've been telling you. It's the same thing. I'd like to tell every cop in the department, if you can place an object at the scene of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, then don't go thrashing around looking for an object that's an exact duplicate. Mm. Don't play Hawkshaw. Any microscope will tell you there are no two things in this world exactly identically alike. I don't care if it's a pair of shoes, a gun, a crowbar, or your two front teeth. Now, that's all lines up to me. Think you're going to have trouble? I don't know, Lee. We shouldn't have. You got the three of them at the scene of the crime... That ought to be enough for the court? Yeah, I hope so. You don't sound sure. Well, Lee, there's only one time I'm sure about thieves like Bryson. Yeah? Let me check him in at San Quentin. Two days later, Charles Bryson and his two accomplices, Henderson and Miller, were arraigned in municipal court on a date set for their preliminary hearing. Four days later, the preliminary hearing was held and the three of them were bound over for arraignment in Superior Court. In the weeks that followed, before their arraignment and Superior Court trial... Ben and I worked along with the district attorney's office preparing the case against the three men, taking statements, running down additional evidence, checking and rechecking, piecing together the facts which we hoped would earn a conviction for each of the criminals. We weren't positive that had happened. The strongest part of our case was going to come out of the crime lab, the testimony of Lee Jones. And we knew as well as Lee did that, generally speaking, juries are not too much in sympathy with scientific facts when it has to do with physical evidence. 
Generally, they don't follow technical cases too well. We also knew that the three defendants had a good lawyer, a clever one. Getting convictions wasn't going to be easy. The trial opened in Superior Court June 2nd. Ben and I testified when we were called on. On the morning of June 9th, the jury retired to deliberate. Late that afternoon, we got a call from the Hall of Justice. Yes, Mitty. Mm-hmm, yeah. Both of them, huh? I see. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, that's life, I guess. Yes, I... Jury's back, Joe. They came up with a verdict. What's the story? Anderson and Miller, they found them both guilty. First-degree burglary. Yeah, what about Bryson? They let him go. Well, maybe it was no great shock to us, but after the time and effort we put in on the case, it was a disappointment. The worst of the three criminals had been set free. At the trial, Bryson had taken the stand and told the court the same cock and bull story he told Ben and I, that he'd gone to the church, the scene of the burglary, to plead with Henderson and Miller not to commit the crime. Bryson had a good personality and a fast line of talk. It wasn't hard to see how he could convince a jury that he was only an innocent bystander. The biggest obstacle that stood in the way of convicting Bryson was that the prosecution, the district attorney, according to law, could not call to the attention of the jury Bryson's previous criminal record, especially his two prior convictions for burglary. To them, because of the limitations of the law, he was presented as a private citizen with as much integrity and as clean of any previous guilt as you or your neighbor. Henderson and Miller were committed to the state penitentiary to serve sentences as prescribed by law, and Charles Bryson, shortly after the trial, left the city. Two months passed. Saturday, August 8th, I started on my vacation. Two weeks later, on August 22nd, I checked back in for work. Hi, Joe. Good to see you. Hi, Jim. What's been doing? Oh, not too much. How'd the vacation go? Oh, pretty good, thanks. Mother and I went up north to visit some relatives up in Marin County. It was a nice trip for her. She hadn't been feeling too well, you know. Oh, it's too bad. Get any fishing done? A little, yeah. That's sure beautiful country up here. You been around? No, no, I took off today. You've been putting in some full days while you've been gone. Yeah, that's all. Uh, anything special doing? Oh, nothing too big. String of chain store burglaries, south end of town. I've been working along with Ben. Yeah? Giving you much trouble? It's been going a couple of weeks. Not getting any better. Mm-hmm. I'll begin to feel the pressure a little. Well, how's it stand? Any leads on the suspect? Just one. Yeah? A guy by the name of Charles Bryson. When our suspect, Charles Bryson, left Los Angeles after his trial some three months before, we had reports that he was headed east for the city of Memphis, Tennessee. In subsequent weeks, we had word that he was also seen in St. Louis, Missouri, where police officers had him under surveillance as a possible suspect in a robbery there. On or about August 10th, the St. Louis police lost track of Bryson. A week later, the newest series of burglaries began throughout Los Angeles. The thief's M.O. matched that of Bryson down to the last detail. The places burglarized were chain stores, supermarkets generally. The method of entry was the same, prying open a back window with a pinch bar or similar tool. The manner in which the safes were opened in the various business places, that matched too. So did five sets of foot impressions found at the scene of five different burglaries, each of them made by a man wearing tennis shoes. The operation corresponded exactly to the way Bryson worked. But there was one big hitch in the investigation. Nobody could be sure Bryson was back in town. No one had seen him. No one had heard from him. Monday, August 24th, 8 a.m. Got us running in circles so far, Joe. I can't figure. I bet lunch money is Bryson, but we can't even start to prove. Well, how about the people in town Bryson runs with? They all been checked out? The one we know about, yeah. His friends, relatives, all his known hangouts. We've been over it every inch of the way. If anybody knows, they're not saying. There's no trace of them. Yeah, that's a possibility. Maybe we're wrong. Go ahead. What do you mean, maybe we're wrong? Well, the only lead we've got is the M.O. Bryson isn't the only thief who operates that way. It could be another man using the same system. Yeah, we thought about that. You ran a check through the stats office? Yeah, uh uh-huh. The only known burglars in our records who operate like Bryson are either in jail or out of town or they're dead. We checked it through a couple of times. Keeps coming out the same way. Bryson's the only strong lead we got. Yeah, but I got it. Burglary Friday. Yes, sir. You know, sir, Sergeant Tabor's out right now. Is there any message? Well, I guess about ten minutes. Yes, sir, right. I'll tell him. Thank you. You sure that the M.O. on all these jobs matches Bryson, huh? All the way. That's what's got me stumped. If the guy is pulling these jobs and he is in town, somebody should have spotted him. These chain stores he's hitting. We've had stakeouts on him for ten days. Uh-huh. I've got every informant we know watching for Bryson, and not a sign. Hopefully a minute ago, Jim said they'd call back. Oh, thanks. Got this teletype this morning. I've got an announcement from San Quentin. Might be a line on Bryson. Let me see. An answer on that mail watch we asked him for. Uh-huh. What angle's this, Ben? You and them, the church burglars, Miller and Henderson, do this in at San Quentin? Oh, yeah. You asked Clinton for a mail watch on both of them, did you? Yeah, I figured there was a chance Bryson might write to him. Mm-hmm. Looks like it got us a lead. Well, what have they got there? 
That's from the warden's office, and so it says, uh, regarding your request on information concerning Charles Bryson, on August 22nd, Anthony Miller, our number 172156J, received letter from person signing himself George Cameron. Contents of letter suspicious. Cameron, does that mean anything to you? I just checked Bryson's package again down R and I. Cameron was his mother's maiden name. Bryson's used it as an alias before, quite a few times. Uh-huh. How about the return address on the letter, Ben? Los Angeles? Moon Post Office, General Eleven. Monday, 10 a.m. We alerted the post office detail and arranged for a mail watch on all incoming letters through general delivery addressed to Charles Bryson, George Cameron, or to another of the suspect's known aliases. A week passed. No sign of Bryson, no trace of any of his correspondence through general delivery. Another week went by. Two more chain store burglaries. The M.O. in each case was the same. It matched closely to Bryson's known working habits. But despite our precautions and the close check we maintained on his friends and his known hangouts, the suspect still remained unseen and unheard from. On September 9th, an informant of Ben's called us at the office and told us he thought he'd seen Bryson the night before. Yeah, Matty, where was that? Mm-hmm, yeah, right, we'll check it, thanks. Bye. Bryson's supposed to have been seen there for Martin Beverly Boulevard last night, drinking in a bar up there. You're pretty sure it was Bryson? He thinks so, yeah. Got the name of the place here. We can check for the bartender, see if he can identify Bryson's mugs out. Right. I'll get my top coat, huh? All right. I get it. Marjorie Friday. Yes, sir. When was that? Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I got it. Yes, sir, right away. Post office detail. Bryson called for a mail at the general delivery half an hour ago. Where is he? They following? 280 Glenmore, apartment 6. He's there now. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. <laughs> September 9th, Tuesday, 11.30 a.m. The burglary suspect, Charles Bryson, was placed under surveillance at the apartment where he'd gone immediately after calling for his mail at the general delivery window in the main post office. Three teams of men were assigned the job of following Bryson alternately, 24 hours a day. We waited for a chance to get into his apartment and search it while it was empty, but it never occurred. Somebody was always there, either Bryson or a tall, dark-haired woman, his common-law wife. During the week that followed, the suspect was watched everywhere he went. He attempted no burglaries. On the eighth day, the stakeout was removed. Three nights later, two burglaries were committed. Both jobs bore the marks of the suspect's M.O., but we couldn't prove a thing against him. We knew the setup we had was going nowhere. If we wanted to get Bryson red-handed, if we wanted a case against him that'd stand up in any court, we had to find a new approach. Lee Jones came up with an idea. There's a job of stuff right here. The technical name for its emphasis. I guess you heard of it? I think mm-hmm. I've heard you mention the name, Lee. That's about all. Some kind of luminous powder, isn't it? It glows in the dark. Uh, no, not exactly. Yeah, take a look at some. Yeah. There, you see? Colorless, odorless, no smell at all to it. It's a coal tar product. We call it crystalline hydrocarbon. Mm-hmm, I see. Now, here's the point of the thing. When you take this anthracene powder and rub it into the surface of an object, it's completely invisible as naked eye. You never know it's there. Here, let me show you. How about my coat sleeves, huh? That'll do. Got the powder all over it. Some in your hand, too. Rub it in, like so. Mm-hmm. Now, can you see or feel any of the powder where I put it on? No, nothing there. Now, let me switch on this lamp here. This is an ultraviolet light. Now, watch when I turn it on your arm, where we rubbed on the powder. Mm-hmm. Well, look at your hand, Joe, like it's lighting up. Yeah, my coat sleeve, too. It's glowing. How about it? Will this stuff rub off, Lee? Try it. You're spreading it all over yourself, everything you touch. Yeah. Anything harmful in it, Rick? No. Now, watch when I turn the lamp off. You see? Gone. Never even know you had it on. Only time it shows up is under ultraviolet light. Well, does it stay on you indefinitely, Rick? No, the maximum is generally about, oh, say, 24 hours. Mm-hmm. You guarantee it'll work, huh? Well, all physics, Joe. Under the proper conditions, it's got to. It's just what I tell my classes up at the academy. Crooks and chorus girls have one thing in common. Yeah? They show up better when you put them under the right kind of light. <laughs> When we left Lee Jones at the crime lab, we figured we had the potential solution in our hands, but there was still a lot to be done before we could go into any court of law with a case that we were positive was strong enough to convict Charles Bryson. Number one, we had to get into his apartment when it was unoccupied. 
find the set of burglary tools he was using and doused them thoroughly with anthracene. The same for the clothes he worked in. Number two, we had to get Bryson into custody within 24 hours after he moved on the burglary job or the anthracene wouldn't work. Number three, we had to find the loot taken in the burglary in his possession. Ten days passed before we got a chance to make good on the first step. I get it, Joe. Right. Burglary and Merrill. Yeah, Jim. Mm-hmm, good. Fine, we'll be right out. Good break, Joe. And Bryson, what's that? They hold him in on the traffic warrant, speed him. Book him into the main jail right now. Good chance to go through his apartment. What about his wife? She's still up there, isn't she? She's on her way to put up bail for him. Yeah? Apartment's empty. By the time Bryson was bailed out, Ben and I, along with Jim Tabor and Lee Jones, had combed through Bryson's apartment and finally uncovered a set of burglary tools and work clothes carefully hidden beneath the floorboards under a kitchen cabinet directly below the sink. Lee Jones contaminated each of the tools with the invisible anthracene powder and also the work clothes. We checked the apartment for any possible loot taken in the burglaries, but we found nothing. We put everything back exactly the way we found it, and then we left and went back to the office. We stood by until 4 a.m. waiting for a call that would indicate that Bryson might be out on another burglary job. Nothing happened. The next night, up until 10 o'clock, it was the same routine. At a few minutes past 10, we got a 459 call on a chain drugstore out on Alvarado Street. Lee Jones had his portable ultraviolet light all ready to go. Ben and I picked him up at the crime lab, and the three of us drove to the scene of the burglary. Straight back here, Lee. Can I help you with the light? I can handle it, thanks. That's the window they figured you got in. Safe there in the corner. Yeah, there's not too much of it left. You all set, Lee? You got the extension card for the light, Romero? Yeah, right here. I'm just plugging it in. Yeah, okay. All set. All right, switch it on, will you? Right. Well? Yep. Seems like it. What do you got in the window there, Joe? Look at that. And the same tracks all over, foot impressions there, tool marks on the safe. Left prints on the floor, on the wall. No question, he left plenty of trail. All right, let's get him. Lee Jones put in a call to the crime lab and ordered a photographer out to take pictures at the scene of the burglary. Lee and the photographer would stay at the scene to gather physical evidence and take pictures of the anthracene prints and markings for presentation in court. 10.52 p.m. Jones packed up the ultraviolet lamp and Ben and I took it along with us. We drove directly to Bryson's apartment. Nobody was there. No. Nobody in the bedroom either. How about that? I don't know. I don't get it. Bryson's had plenty of time to get back here. Over an hour. What about his wife? The only time we know she left was when she had to go bail him out in that traffic one. Yeah. Doesn't look like they pulled out, does it? There's a closet full of clothes in there. A lot of their personal things around. Yeah. Sure looks like they were expecting to come back. We might check with the apartment house manager. He could tell us if they gave notice to move. Yeah. If... Oh, let's see here. What do you got? No, if you're on the desk. See, he says, um, Charlie, I'm sorry, but I told you it just doesn't work out with us. When you read this, I'll be on my way east. I don't want to be mean with you. I just think it'll work better if we forget each other, that's all. Thanks for everything so long. Sign Ruth. Well, I guess she doesn't like him much either. No. Wait a minute. That's what have you done? Police officers, Bryson. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, I know who you are. I remember. What do you want? Man, you want to plug in that light? Yeah. The outlet right over here. What is all this? It said you wanted to talk to me. What's it all about? You all set, Ben? Just a minute. All right, okay. Turn it on. What are you doing? Hey, what are you trying to do to me? You've done it all to yourself, mister. Lit up like a Christmas tree, Joe. It's all over. And here's hey. the foot. The clothes, your hands. What is it? There's, there's light glowing all over them. What are you doing? It's a chemical, Bryson. Harmless. Same stuff you left all over the drugstore tonight. Pack up, Ben. Come on, let's go, Bryson. I don't understand. What's this whole thing all about? You'll understand it. Here. Huh? A note for you. Come on. How's that, Jim? Let's go, mister. I guess I didn't know her. Just a tramp. I guess I should have been smart about it. Yeah, I guess so. Come on. How could I know? She said she was in love with me. I believed it. Well, what am I going to say when they ask me? All our friends are all going to ask me. They'll say, what happened to Ruth? I'll say, what happened this time? What am I going to say happened this time? What are you going to say to the jury this time? <laughs>
On December 10th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. (laughs) Charles Lang Bryson was tried and convicted on three counts of first-degree burglary. This is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than five years. However, due to his previous convictions on this and other felony counts, Bryson was judged an habitual criminal. He was sentenced to spend the rest of his natural life in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department.